I am president. Is there no flash action? I got, yeah. So uh, I haven't slept in days. This is the final day of the New York City Horror Film for the 2009, uh, the ninth annual New York City Horror Film Festival. I'm saying 2009. Jesus, I haven't slept in days. It never ends. Once again, uh, you know, thank you for your patience. Um, everybody get a little coffee, get a little bagel. Y'all good? I gotta tell you, I, you know, I don't know how the hell I'm gonna get through this panel, but I am so excited about this panel. It is absolutely friggin' outstanding. And I really, really want to say thank you to all the panelists for, for coming out and doing this. Uh, you know, and I know it did, it did it as a favor to meet in the festival. So um, we appreciate it. Um, I guess I will just roll as soon as Kimberly puts out some order for these lovely people. Probably nobody needs it more than me. So uh, we're going to get started, and I guess we will uh, we will uh, start by um, introducing this year's Lifetime Achievement Award winner, or honoree, I should say. It's not really a you know, a win. <laughs> Mr. Robert Inglin. And I think it's a little fitting that um, we will bring out last year's. Uh, Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Mr. Bill Lustig. You guys know him as Candyman. I know him as just a badass dude who I love like a brother, Mr. Tony Todd. One of my favorite character actors, a very very lucky to recently be hanging with this guy. And uh, we're working on a project that is, uh, we hopefully is gonna just be blowing up all over. Gonna be blowing up all over the place. One of the most instantly recognizable character actors you'll ever see, Mr. Michael Wright. Michael! And of course, our regular my homie from Fangoria Magazine, Mr. Michael can go. So, I'll keep this light and breezy. You all got your mics? Because I know I need it today. I gotta say that, uh, what did you, you think of the experience last night there, uh, Rob? Oh, I get it. Well, you know, the experience last night was great, and I was humbled, and as I said, you know, you, to, to be recognized in, uh, in New York City is so great for me, because you, 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 it's the center of the universe. But even better is, is having this little reunion here with this gentleman to my right, yes. Mr. Michael Wright today. We worked together back in the 80s, and I have been <laughs> such a fan of his before this, I got to work with this him. This is the most astonishing thing, I must tell you. I mean, I, I knew this guy as Willie. Back when I, knew, <laughs> I knew Willie. I mean, like, yeah, he was my whipping boy, I man. And there he goes, man. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I turn around, and he's like, you know, whoa. I mean, the number one thing in our film, Freddy Krueger. I'm like, what, Robert Ingram? Freddy Krueger, what? Oh, my God. <laughs> no, it's just been so great over the years, you know, to flick on HBO and, and catch Michael cooking on, uh, on Oz, you know, or, 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 or watch cable and, and, and find him in a Robert Altman movie. And, and uh, I, I'm just such a fan of his, and it just, you know, I was ready to cry back here backstage. But, and my old pal Bill, you know, uh, and Tony, uh, it's, just, it's just fun uh, seeing everybody again, hanging. Well, that's mutual all around. It's a, it's a, it's a true love for stuff here today. <laughs> okay, so we got the two I traditionally, I traditionally uh, uh, start this panel always the, the, the same way. And I'll ask, starting with Michael and coming down this way. Um, briefly, though, your favorite horror film and why? I guess my favorite horror film, and still one of my favorite films of all time, uh, has got to be. Uh, 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 Ridley Scott's Alien. Yes. God, yes. just an amazing, amazing film. I mean, even even from the time that it was promoted, I mean, you saw these uh, these egg-shaped kind of figures on 
huge billboard and you didn't know what the <laughs> hell it was, you know? What was it about? And I mean, the way they sort of let the kind of mystery linger and linger and linger, and the way that all of the events sort of just, you know, were so unforeseen in the film. I mean, and you didn't see the damn creature, you know, until about the end of the film. But nonetheless, I mean, you were just breathless throughout the film. I mean, and I, 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 I gotta say, that, that, that's that gotta be high, high on my list, uh, uh, apart from, um, <clears throat> Nightmare. <laughs> I, I think um, you know I, I vacillate with with films, uh, and 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 some of them seem a little snobby, so I don't mention them as much. But Sorry. I think truly, uh, I my test is like Desert Island. You know, what do you really want on a desert island? You know, uh, what do you want to listen to? What do you want to see? And with, and I we can all talk and try to be hip and cool, but. I mean, I know one thing I want. I want uh, Ella Fitzgerald singing the Harold Arlen songbook because I can listen to that over and over and over again. And I want Brian De Palma's film, Sisters, nice. would be my horror movie. Uh, it's some of the best split screen I've ever seen. Uh, you know, I know that uh, the end of her life got a little tragic uh, for a while, uh, later later years. But, but Margot Kidder is absolutely extraordinary as the Siamese twins in that. And... Fuck me, but is William Finley the best mad scientist in the history of film? <laughs> and and I know he lives here in Manhattan. And you know, if anybody runs into him on the street, give him a shout out. He's still one of my favorite actors. I worked with him in a Toby Hooper film, and I, I, I you know, Phantom of the Paradise and and uh, The Fury. And uh, he's just an extraordinary, extraordinary actor. And and I think that reinvented uh, the mad scientist. It's sort of James Whale mad scientist better than than anybody has uh, before or since for that film. So Sisters would be my favorite. You no, know, we've actually been trying to get him to come out for a screening. But yeah, he doesn't, he was, he's just not down. <laughs> but all, and like all the time. Yeah, he lives right on Fifth Avenue. Yeah, like, yeah I mean, in the West you Bowl. can bump into him, go to the store, but like we said, talk about hard movies, come out, and we'll screen one of them, and, and you know, he's like, ah. <laughs> I mean, I understand he's a really, really nice guy. Bill? Oh, God. I vacillate too, and uh, I'd have to say uh, my favorite, well, I guess the one I just recently watched again would be Psycho. I just watched the Blu-ray of Psycho, and that movie really holds up, and it still gets under my skin. But I also like to say Nightmare on, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, Night of the Living Dead, um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and The Exorcist. But I, I, think, I think Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and you know, it has that title, it's one of those titles that you know that, that for a long time people were afraid to take it seriously, and I am worked five times now with Toby, with Toby, but that's probably one of the most uh, next to D. W. Griffith's work, one of the most ripped off films ever made. I mean, there's that, that he practically reinvented uh, an entire cinema with, with certain sequences of that film, and you see them in everything from CSI you know, to uh, big budget movies. And uh, I don't think that film gets enough credit. No, I agree, it's a, it's a genre in itself. I mean. Well, it was sort of a period, I think, in the uh, 70s when a lot of the um, horror films, and even some of the uh, narratives, all had a kind of semi-documentary look to it. And so you had this feeling of it being out of control. It was like the French Connection was a cop film, but was it really, a, you know, it had more going on, you know, because it just, now that's become a cliche, but back then it was it was revolutionary, all coming from the French New Wave of shooting kind of documentary style. Cinema, uh, cinema verite. Yeah, yeah, cinema verite, and uh, and uh, you know, and, and, it, and and I think Romero with Night of the Living Dead brought it to uh, brought it to horror. Well, uh, speaking of D. W. Griffith. Uh, I guess one of the most horrific films I've ever seen was Perfect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know there was room for me in the film industry. Oh, <laughs> Fortunately, I saw Romero's Night of Living Dead, and I said, "Ah, oh, yeah, we too can carry this, can't we, Mike?" <laughs> I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Um, I, I got two, I think, that ties in, and they're completely different. And I know Mike will. Uh, if I go already knows the answer to one, which is Rosemary's Baby. Oh, oh, oh I, when I saw that, 
and so not only have Roman Polanski's brilliant work, regardless of what he does as a person, uh, but as a filmmaker, just totally outstanding, and creating New York City as a living, breathing entity that was uh, just, I mean, the Dakota is just something else, you know? I mean, who would have presaged, you know, what would have happened in the Dakota, I mean, some 12 or so years later, I mean, yeah. that right, itself exactly. was a horror. Yeah, it's also exactly. the first exactly. movie to deal with, with, with yuppies. Right. And yuppie behaviors, and, right. and also, and, and also, act of greed. I mean, John yeah. Hughes, yeah. Hughes, 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 wonderful wish. I got to just be successful. What would I do? You know, it's incredible uh, is the phone booth in, on the corner. Uh, right. a, a, a benign phone booth on the corner becomes this frightening, you know, yeah. set piece. It's just just kind of walking kind of by kind of the like coder. That's a scene where a word cast does his yes, this little thing, right? Walk. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. We actually, they did it at uh, Bryant Park this year. Right. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the uh, phones. You know, is it me or did I just wake up, I got all these voices rattling in my head and <laughs> speaking my thoughts? It's a great <laughs> phone. What? It's a great phone. I know I'm schizophrenic, but damn. <laughs> now I'm less of everybody. And secondly, just uh, the flip side, when I was a kid, I would watch Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein every uh, <laughs> single chance I had. Okay, just to Best see things. everybody doing their thing and laughing and just feeling the joy in my belly, so. And that into the future, what everybody else in this room, because I know there's some brains out here, whatever you guys lay down or write or photograph or make music or, you know, just keep, keep everybody gainfully and skillfully employed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, my well favorite said. is, will always be John Carpenter's Halloween because yeah. it was the film, it's probably the second most ripped off horror film in history. And um, hmm. it's funny, I just saw it last week at a, a show up in Poughkeepsie. They got a print and they screened it. and. Even though it, it's not as scary as it once was, partially because it's been imitated so many times and sequelized, just to watch the craft of that film and see what John Carpenter did. I mean, he, he kind of invented a whole way of telling a horror story. Um, you know, it, as much as anything else, the unstoppable killer, the, the guy who can't be killed. You know, you saw that in Terminator and Fatal Attraction and so many other films since then. And just for its influence and for the fact that it scared the hell out of me when I was about 10 or 11 and set me on the path that basically brought me here, so. <laughs> Um, it's always Halloween, even if it's not as scary as it once was, it's still just a great work of cinema. Definitely a great time on Pleasant. And a great oh yeah. yeah. Come on. Yeah. Really another great time. Um, and on that same note, like, um, and since there's so many great actors and directors on this panel, um, starting with Michael, any other projects that you've worked on, like Five Heartbeats or, or, or uh, um, The Principal or any of these great things you're doing or Sugar Hill, that, all, the, all three of just such great films. Did you ever get the feeling when you were working on any of these films that, that this was a special one? This was going to be like you all just filmed it? Um, uh, to be succinct, that when I was working on the five heartbeats with Robert Townsend, we were sitting around and we were going like, It's going to be a classic, man. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but I mean, did, did you think it was something? You know, did you think, well, we go to every film with, you know, just all best intentions and let the chips fall where they met? Robert? So, like, would you no, guys, would you know, for me, I, I, I spent three months in the New South with. Jeff Bridges, who just won an Oscar, Sally Field, who actually, this movie got her, Norma Ray, uh, a, a, an unknown guy, a bodybuilder named Arnold Schwarzenegger, Scatman Crothers and I were roommates, Helena Kalianotis, the lesbian from Five Easy Pieces, uh, Joanna Cassidy from Blade Runner, and I thought, and this was the follow-up movie to Five Easy Pieces, Bob Rafelson, independent cinema renaissance of the 70s, and we all thought it was gonna be the biggest, with Jimmy Carter, the New South, blah, blah, blah. We thought it was gonna be the biggest Joe, thing Joe, since Joe. sliced bread, yeah. Joe, yeah, Joe, you know, everybody. And we all thought it was, because we were working hard and, and, and working with, with, with Rafelson, and every day we would go back to the Holiday Inn, and where there would be the, that kind of uh, meeting room, conference room that they had in, in those hotels, for the executive bar. And they'd put a they'd put a tablecloth up on the wall. We'd all sit on the floor. There'd be an open bar, and Bob would let us watch everybody's dailies. Everyone would watch it. 
because he would tell you if certain scenes were going to be cut. If he wanted you to see all of your stuff, all of your masters, all the, all the sides of your close-ups, because he wanted to tell you when you were great, even though it might not wind up in the movie. He loved us all so much, and it was a great early learning experience for me. It was 1975, and I thought it was going to be the, the, biggest, you know, the biggest hit in the world, and it died. You know, one good review in the New York Times, and it went away. You know, now, thank God, you know, it's been renaissanced on cable because of, of Jeff's success. You know, they're sort of like Jeff Bridges nights now. You know, and you get to see Hearts of the West, and I don't know if you guys saw Door on the Floor, but all this terrific work Jeff's been doing that was kind of unnoticed, you know, or, or, or sort of in the shadow of Big Lebowski and his more populist stuff. Well, do you think that that could actually affect the shoot? When you all go in, sort of like with your heads held high, like you, you just think you're doing something great work, if, you know, does it happen? I don't think that hurts. Does, I don't think it hurts. Does, uh, I just think that, and I certainly don't think that's why the film failed. I think the film failed because it was a little bit ahead of its time. It was an ensemble piece in the spirit of Robert Altman. Um, and it was about something that people weren't talking yet, which was that there had been this sort of shift in, in that part of America. And it was also about the beginning of the preoccupation with health, the gym, gym fanatics, and yeah, all that. Yeah, I, I made two films with Robert Altman, and I took they were going to be huge hits. I mean, <laughs> they didn't make no money. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, I mean, but the camaraderie and, and, and the experience is, is just something that's exceptional. I mean, and uh, wouldn't trade it for anything. So, so I, I got, I, you know, with you, I always bring it back to Maniac, because it's one of my favorite films of all time. Yeah. Uh, I, I, so, I mean, I probably have asked you this every single panel because you've panels with all the time in front of our regulars. But did you guys like when you and Joe went out and set out to like just make this like dirty, grimy, just you know, the shock them? <laughs> the truth is, Joe believed in the project. I mean, he really, truly believed that we were making a classic movie, and. I did not share his belief. I thought we were lucky we were going to play in Texas drive-ins in 42nd Street. But Joe really sincerely believed that we were making a classic movie. And I, I've often said this, but people who, who, um, who are substance abusers, who die young, sometimes have this extraordinary sensitivity and psychic ability. I don't know. Have you ever noticed? I don't know. I've, I've noticed this with some people who, who have died young, who have, who have you know, had difficult lives, um, but they have some ability to see through things. And Joe was that kind of guy. He could see the talent in Robert England. He would, you know, he would, he would encourage people that he would meet and, and, and you know, try to help their careers along. But um, that's the truth. I'm, I'm shocked. And somebody asked me recently, when did I realize that Maniac was a classic? And it's only been for maybe a year or two that I've actually acknowledged that it is a classic. I, up until then, I was just thinking it's a fluke one day. To, you know, one day, there was, aha, look at this, you know. Yeah, we're gonna be on the piano. You should've been like, oh, man, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's gonna be a classic. Yeah. Well, so Tony, I, I'm gonna throw, throw it to you now. Because the first thing I think I said to you, do you remember when we met down in Ohio? Awful convention. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're at the bar, yeah. and I walk up to him, and I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, buy this guy a drink. You know, maybe he'll talk to me for like two seconds. And I told him, I said, sure, buy me a drink, man. Sit down. You know, and the first time I was like, I got to ask you, man, what was it like being on the set of Platoon? You're a young actor. You're with some of the great, you know, old guys that are going to become the greatest actors of our generation, including you, my man. And, like, what was it like walking out? Did you guys get any kind of sense of no, what that we, picture was? We, or had, we had absolutely no idea. Uh, that was my very first film role. So I was just literally doing the Gene Kelly role and kicking my heels up on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> so proud that I had been, you know, chosen for this thing. And even when we were in the Philippines shooting, we, we, I don't think we knew. Um, and I'm just proud to be part of that fraternity. Uh, you know, as actors, you just, and I think one thing that keeps us going uh, is that we constantly surprise ourselves. And I'm still pinching myself to this day that a, that a, a kid raised by a single mom and, and, and projects in Hartford, Connecticut, has actually had the chance to travel the world, meet interesting people, share stories with uh, actors I not only respect, admire, and uh, appreciate, and directors that have given me the opportunity to do different jobs. 
I just wrapped something. Uh, this is no slight or promotion, but I have to say, I wrapped this phone call unbroken. It's Friday morning at 6.15, and I've never had, and I told some of you in here, I have never had an experience like having that phone. Uh, literally, I've never seen a crew, a small crew, so dedicated that we would linger uh, half hour after shoot time in the cold parking lot, 34 degrees, and just reflect on what we had laid down. So, you sort of feel like a jazz musician at that point. And you need to cool down period? Yeah, you know, yeah, you're like the whole thing, doing my favorite things at the umpteenth time, but you hear something different in the song, and it's the same rhythm, and it's a rhythm of life. And uh, I think being Sunday uh, is a wonderful, this is a church, you know, this craft is a church, and I, I'm, I'm blessed to be here. And I hope, you know, everybody can find their dream, have an actuality to at least, maybe not hold on to it, but look it in the mirror. That of course, people make one stuff. I've never made a film like that, so. Well, you're about to. I'll have it back, what you know. That, that's part of the wonder of what we do. I mean, is that you know your next job, you know, can be your best job. Yeah, you I don't mean, know. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary thing. I mean, wow, you know. I always say, you know, people say, what, what's your favorite picture? I say, what's the picture that I'm doing next? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, you know, because I'm going to try to do that better than the thing that I did last, you know, and that's it. You know. the, it's also, you, know, we, you never set out to make a bad movie, and, and no. sometimes we're doing, you're, you know, you're doing low budget, sometimes you're doing big budget, sometimes you're working with prestige people, sometimes you're working with unknowns, and you always, in your mind's eye, at least I do, I always want it to be the best I always imagine it. It's right. the best possible thing right. coming alive off those pages as, as it can be. It doesn't always turn out that way, but you want it to be. I mean, it doesn't matter what it is. You look at it and you think, well, if this is done right, it will be exactly what it is. Yeah. Done right, which is, I, I'll do that. You know? and that's how you approach it every time, out of the box. You know, you want it to be the best thing that you've ever done. And I mean, I can appreciate what Tony's saying, you know, because here he's just wrapped this film and wow. He said it's the best work he's ever done, and my God, you know, I mean, what a wonder to be able to say something like that and be in this profession and be in this business for as long as we all have collectively, and to be able to say that, you know, to make that kind of statement, I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary blessing, you know. So, I mean, it's not like and, of, and of course, like, it can go the other way, too. It's such a great time making the film, such a family, yeah, and I know that, you know, of course, it, Saying that's gonna happen. Yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Take you out here. Make no money. Why did it make no money? So I guess right down the line again, and somebody like me, you know, who's an aspiring director, um, all of you guys, including you, Mike, all your views and stuff that you've been through, um, what to, to for you guys who are actors and films who, who directed such great films, what what makes a good actor? Directing, like, what do you like to see in a first-time director, or even a, a, a you know an old hat at it? Old yeah, old <laughs> I'm gonna go right down the line. That I think people want to know. I can be very succinct about this. Um, uh, what we do uh, in terms of this entire business is we work very, very hard to make it look easy. That's it. You work very, very hard to make it look easy and seamless. I mean, and that's the hallmark of every great performer and every great director. That's it. Yeah, that's it. It's simple. It, there's that moment for the director, I think when you, all I want is just to have that moment where I know I'm communicating. And I, that's it. I mean, that's a time, I've worked on both sides of the camera and making yourself understood is just the only, the only respect I need. I just want to make sure that, and, and sometimes it's a week or two in, you know, and, and a lot, and some directors with the technology are so wrapped up in the technology that they, you, you, you'll, it'll be two or three weeks into a shoot or before that human thing happens, you know, with the director that we all know from the theater happens on, you know, the very first day. Um, but film directors, you know, are, are wearing so many hats and responsible for so many elements of the production and decisions about that and, and, and taste. And so sometimes it seems to me, at least in the last couple of years, takes a little longer for that, that human thing to happen sometimes. Um, but I understand that's part of my job too, 
is you know is, is once I once I've been cast once we've been cast a lot of directors just think I've got Tony I've got Michael you know that's done. do it do your thing you know and they they don't really want to get in our way and but I sort of need to know that when I ask them about you know the wardrobe or, yeah, or a prop or something that they're that they're on the same page I think yeah well, you know like for, for a lot of these directors I mean they they they, they are you know of the you know preoccupied with all of these sort of technical uh, elements of the things in the film. And uh, so the, the hallmark, the, the 80% of directing actors is <laughs> choosing the right actor for the role. I say, you go get a boy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's it. Well, I, I think um, I've heard it said many times, but it is the 90% the, uh, the of, of uh, directing actors is the casting. Right. Uh, if you cast the right actors, um, and, um, and you know, you, you really are just at that point just tweaking things. You're not telling it. You'll never. If you ever get to a point where you need, feel the need to have to tell an actor what to do, then you then you haven't done your job as a director. You should be hiring the people you feel comfortable with. Also, a very important thing is making movies is so chaotic and stressful that what you've got to do is to create a safe environment on that set. No matter what's going on, you've got to create an environment that allows the actors and the people, the, the, the DP, the AC, everybody on the set, to be able to focus on their work and not be, uh, not feel the pressure as hard as it can be, not to feel the production pressure, but to create a place where they can play and, and, and do their work, and, do, and that's how you're gonna get the best work. And that's something I often tell people, you have to, you have to be relaxed, you have to, that's the only way you're gonna do good work. Play is a good word uh, that Bill just used. We used to be called players, remember? The old, the old uh, the bills uh, on, the, on the theater said the players tonight. And I've even had friends on Broadway that were understudying, and, and, and you see all the understudies going to the bar after the show started <laughs> because they don't have to work that night. And, and they ask each other, are you playing tonight? Are you playing tonight? And I think there's a real privilege that, that, that Tony and Michael and myself and, and, and Bill to some extent that We've been chosen by society as to, to continue to play because maybe we were the ones that played the best when we were kids. Yeah, you know? yeah, play and and while the rest of you have to go work in a cubicle, <laughs> 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 we play. Lawrence, Lawrence Olivier used to say that the, the best part of a play was the drink afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, people talk about Joe Spinell um, and his performance in Maniac, but what most people don't real, what people don't realize, is as soon as we yell cut. Joe was joking around with everybody. He'd be joking on the way to the set, you know, do his intense scene, and then just, you know, and, and that you'll find with many of the really fun actors to work with is they, they, they're in the moment, but they don't carry that moment to, to, to become, you know, they, they, they realize that, we, that the only way that this is gonna work is if we all have fun. Right, I mean, you it's know? all over. I mean, like, uh, you know, you, you work, butt off, you know, but like when the man says cut, you take the character off and you hang it up in the closet, man, and then, you know, it's time to play, it's it, you know, it's done. Judd, Judd, uh, I did a picture called Relentless and it starred Judd Nelson and he was playing a killer and, um, and Judd used to do this thing with the ADs, it's like say, I won't, I'm not coming out of my trailer today, <laughs> and he would be like, no, I'm not coming out. No, no, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like I, I don't feel like doing this, right? And then as soon as the AD at this point who had tried to get him out would come over to me and start telling me, Judd won't come out. He needs to, you know, he's he's staying in there. He says he can't come out, he can't work today. And then I'd see Judd behind him like waving to me as he's walking to the <laughs> scene. <laughs> I mean that's fun. It's fun when you play with people like that. You know, he's he's he's, he's playing he's playing sort of this impression of, you know. Of a difficult, he's doing a difficult act of performance, you know. <laughs> you know, like Barrymore, one time he was doing a film, and, you know, it was a, one of those films on one of those ships or something like that, and uh, he was out all night, and nobody could find the guy, and nobody knew where he was, and they started looking around the set, and there he was, laid up on the deck of the ship, totally hung over, and been there all night. <laughs> By the way, Joe used to refer to John, I'm just using my voice, John, he used to refer to, uh, Barrymore, he's called it John Barrymore performance when he's working. Bring me my vodka. <laughs> so yeah, we got sidetracked there, but Tony, the records. Uh, yeah, after, after being in this business, which I consider a business primarily, and a 
playground secondarily for 20 years, and through my myriad of dysfunctionalism, because we're all dysfunctional, and as Michael said, you know, we, you know, uh, and it is still work, but it is a joyous work. Uh, what I look for in a director is family. For me, in order to get comfortable and get into any situation where it's going to be a terrific outcome, I got to feel like that director is a friend of mine, you know, and will tell me unequivocally if I'm bullshitting or encourage me to find another aspect of myself that maybe I didn't see or that he saw. Looking for that ideal kind of like, you know, John Houston, of people that are kind of intangibility, you know, just a brother. And uh, when that happens, I think you're right there in the ballpark. Uh, you can't, you can't have a strike. So you think it's all about trust. Trust, trust, trust and, trust and just liking each other. other. Look, we're gonna spend four to 12 weeks together I better like coming to work with you. That's you know, that's, 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 that's primary part of casting. Yeah. I mean, so these people pick you, they, the first thing they think of, do I want to spend, I want to spend time with this guy? Yeah. And, and, and the person doing it has to be comfortable in their own skin right. as well. They gotta, you have to, we have to love ourselves most of the time in order to effectively bring out that thing that we feel the, the audience is tapped into, yeah. whatever that quality is, whether it's the uh, Michael Wright quality, the Robert England quality, whatever it is, I want that and I want the best of it. And a good director yeah. will bring stroke that and bring it, not in a vanity way, but just as a, as a, just a two-fisted, you know, tell me the truth, what's going to be, who's going to win tonight between the Patriots, right. you know, just <laughs> 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 I'm a good director, I'd, I'd be all over the top. <laughs> yeah, and then he'll bring you down. Bring or, you down. Or, don't, let, to the you, actors don't on, let you fall. To the actors on this panel. And not do, being do afraid of falling. Do you think that, that that remains true no matter of what the budget you guys are working in? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You have, have to like, make it true. Like, you have to you make know, that true. You're working with Craven on a huge thing. You're working oh. with Stone on a huge thing. Oh, yeah. well, oh, but guy. then you do a friend a favor. Mm -hmm. you know, or, or I think this guy's nickel and dime now. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what part of that is though, and, and I've been around so long now, I've seen the changes, but I remember when I, I was doing so-called A movies in the 70s, mm -hmm. big budget films, you know, a film that was $30 million in the 70s was huge. I remember being on Stars Born. I had a, I had a color TV, a little crappy color TV in my dressing room. I thought that was like, I never even knew that existed. You know, I didn't know if people had that. And, and but the thing is, I go on, on, on low budget films now, or I'll do an independent film here or in Europe, and it's nicer than it was back then, just because, even though it's a low budget film, it's just because things are nicer now. I mean, it, it, not because I'm a star or anything like that, it's just, it's just kind of, it's nicer than it was. Even I, I remember yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the hotel rooms are nicer. I don't know what, but it's, <laughs> it just doesn't it's, matter. Yeah. It's like Tony it's said, I mean, yeah. if you've got that kind of camaraderie with your director and, you, and you've got that kind, if you share that vision, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, I've been on films, man, where I'm changing in the back of a van. That's my dressing room. Yeah. I'm changing, you know, in, 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 in not even a cubby hole or something, but something with partitions, you know, my wardrobe's hung up there. Nobody cares about that. We're here on the show, you know, and it's just nice to be in the show. And that's all that matters. If you like the show, you love the show, you love the people you work with, that's all that matters. Well, and the check's clear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, we'll talk about that. My, <laughs> so, Jack, I, don't, I don't care how much right. an actor is getting paid. I don't think anybody is. I, I think that some people could, I guess, be there for the money, but I've often found that the primary uh, motivation for people doing stuff is not always money. And if it is, then they're not doing the best work. Oh, that's it's, true. It's really. That's, I mean, I wasn't in the mood. It's kind of easy. You know, it's just, you know, I. Never worked on anything like I'm a filmmaker myself. But I've never worked on anything on some on the scales of some of the things you guys you guys have been on. But even on our little production, everybody gets paid on the film. I, I mean, and everybody's doing it for the love of it, and everybody's doing it. For, nobody's getting rich off of it unless they, you know, unless the film Blair Witch is up, you know, or you know, whatever. I know, my friend. I just expect just a little something extra to you. <laughs> well, also, I mean, we, the, the actors, can't we do things can't for it. Yeah. I mean, I, sometimes it's not the project, it's the role, I'll be honest. Exactly. That's what okay. intrigues me. Right. It's some, doing something I haven't done before, it's a, it's a role I haven't played, it's a role I think I should be playing, and I'll be honest too, uh, and this is something you learn, because I'm, I'm a utility actor from the theater, 
You know, uh, I've, I've made directors look like they hired nine guys and they just hired one, like the cast from 39 Steps or, or something like that. I've, you know, I've done plays where I play seven or eight roles, and every time I get off stage, I'm, they're changing a wig or they're, you know, putting high heels on me or whatever. And and I. I was just a utility actor that landed his butt in a tub of butter, so I made a conscious decision uh, to go for screen time uh, because I had done some really major television shows, but I'd done small parts, and you hit the cutting room floor. Because they've got 14 regulars on ER, and you go in to play the boy with leukemia, and it's the guest star, and you know a third of your stuff hits the floor because they are obligated contractually to keep those 14 regulars on screen. That X amount of time. It's in their contracts. And so I learned this at some point in the, in the late 70s or so. I, just, I realized this. I don't know whether it was a Saint Elsewhere or something. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm going for screen time. And that, if, if that sounds selfish or ego, it's also about surviving. No, it is. I mean, I, when I was doing art, I mean, like, uh, you get, you get uh, a script that's uh, normally about, about 60 pages, and the first thing you do, you take that script, and you script it. Oh, and you say, whoa, I got, you know, yeah, I've got the time on this show. I mean, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this is what you're doing, because hey, that's what it's all about. It's like Tony's saying, I mean, you know, um, they don't call it show art, they call it show business. Yeah. That's the bottom line. Right? So, when you work in television, though, and so like when, when you were on Oz, the first thing you do is do a page count. No, on Oz, I used to look at the very last page to find out if I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Did I get thrown off the top tier yet? No, there were two ways I was going off that show. I like to tell people there's two ways. You know, I mean, I, I was either fired or I'm quitting. Fired meant that they killed me. Quitting meant that they had written that I was gang raped. <laughs> <laughs> actually, a friend of mine, um, Ghetto Gillis, who was actually here at the festival the other night, we made a film a few years back called Bloody Streets, and he was on the first season of Oz, and uh, one, of the, one of the lead actors, he, he, uh, he just had two, two kids, twins, and um, they had a rape scene, and his character was going to be raped. And he was the director, I was doing this. And, like, he told me this story, uh, you know, because I loved the show, it was such a big fan of the show. He said, killed him. I, I wasn't, yeah, this, this is what he said. Uh, you know, he's like, you can't do this, you can't, I can't, I can't have this footage existing for my little girls to see, like, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing this. Came into work next week, and what do you know, they're like, killed him, you know, that was it. And he, and he was gone, and he was gone, and he never <laughs> He's a great guy, great actor. He's great in that movie, Bloody Streets. But like, I was just like, dude. It, it, but you know, it was one of those shows. I mean, where you, know, you had like thirty principles. I mean, there just wasn't any room for egos. You know, I mean, and if you weren't going along with the program, hey, you were dead. So yeah, I mean, the section looked at the last page. Man. Do I pick up the soap here? <laughs> <laughs> I actually asked you. Know, well, I'm, I'm, you want me to do what? <laughs> Well, that's pretty, that's pretty though, isn't it? <laughs> um, so, like, sort of on that theme, um, what? Excuse me. Can you reset that? Yeah. I'm just, yeah, I'm just like, oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so, when you guys are on set, or when you're running a set, what do you, what is it, what? In the arc of the story, what, what, what do you think is the proper amount of time to shoot a film? For as an actor, as a director, what do you think? You, you know, I've made films in what they say Corman would make a film in two weeks, and if he could get another couple cans, he'd shoot another right then and there in, in the third week. When you're making, if you're leading a film, what do you think is the, is the time span they need, or what time time span you'd like to have? What well, I'll tell a little story, and you guys don't jump in here, but. Because I'm the oldest guy here, I was up for the, the the sidekick on Kojak when it was called the Marcus Nelson Burgers, and it was a great, great TV movie, and the glorious and my friend, the glorious Roger Robinson, who just got the Tony recently. Roger was my Othello years ago when I was in the theater, and I, I was Iago, and um, they took the crew, Hitchcock's crew. And the best, a crew that had worked together on a half a dozen movies, 
together and made them the TV movie crew for that. And that was the TV movie that came in on time and under budget. Then that became the industry standard. But they didn't realize that this crew had worked together before several, several times. They were like finishing each other's sentences. And that's when, for me, that's when the, the time constraints really started to show. You know, there used to be a point, I mean, you guys remember, you used to be able to rehearse. Now you do on indies, but on, on, on major, most major movies don't rehearse anymore. Television, there's no rehearsal. You know, you, the hardest job in the world, and, and, and Michael and, and, and Tony will tell you this, the, you know, they, they've done a lot more recurring and, and regular roles than I have, but the hardest job in the world is guest starring, because you're the new kid on the block, you know, and you don't know the tone I, necessarily. I, I've never done that. I, it's I the hardest thing in, in the world. Can't jump into yeah, and now it's, it's so quick now. Uh, it didn't used to be that quick. I remember when movies were months long, you know, and now I don't think I've worked longer than five or six weeks. No, but in the I last ten years. Ideally, I mean, I, I like I like the four week period you know, for shooting a film. At least four weeks, you know. I mean, I've done them in, in two, three weeks. We shot Streamers with Altman in three yeah. weeks in a box in Texas, you know. But I mean, that was a fully contained kind of you know, production. But um, uh, like Robert says, you know, you just don't have the time to rehearse, you know. And what you've got to do, you know, is I, I like to take the old Hitchcock maxim, you know, that. You know, you just got to do all of your work on your own prior to getting to the set, so that like Hitchcock never even looked through the lens. You know, when he got on the set, you know, he just shot it because he'd already done the work in advance. And as an actor, as actors, you know, we pretty much got to do that on our own. You know, I mean, before we get to the set, and uh, that's the way to make it happen because there's because of the constraints of time. No. Nope. Well, obviously the script dictates how long you're going to shoot a picture for. Um, that's number one. Number two is, I, don't, I really don't know how you can uh, shoot scenes without rehearsing. I mean, I, I, that's the only way I know where to put a camera is until I see the actors play it. And, you know, before we even set lights or, um, you know, you take the actors, you put, the, you put it up on its feet and you see how it plays out and that's how you kind of figure what you're gonna need, what the shots are. <clears throat> and, and that's how you, that's how I know what I'm doing is until I see it, so. Um, so you, I don't know. you do full rehearsal live? Of course. You when do the, you would do it. Yeah, the, you, do the, you do the whole scene. Well, you put the actors in it, you put the actors you block, in the you block it. And you let them go and do what they do. Yeah. You know, and then you know where to put the lights and where you know to put the mics. Once so I know we have, that. once you know, we know we have. Work that out. Yeah, once that. you have the blocking, once you have the blocking set, then you bring in your keys right. and you run it for the keys. And then, you know, you tell the actors, okay, they go off to makeup and wardrobe and you, and, and, and you know, they, they, they light it and set the, you know, set the, the, the work up. Yeah, as an actor, I'm like working in my living room, you know, two weeks in advance, you know, working on this thing. And then when I hit that set, I make that set, I personalize that set and make it mine and then do virtually what I was doing in my living room. And I let the director look at it, I let the keys look at it, and then they know where to put the lights, they know where to put the mics, they know I'm saying, well, I'll put it down here, and they know I'm saying, all oh, right, up here, you know. And, and hopefully, then, and then we then, and then we go from there. But yeah, it's like the and, same. You know, and as a director, you, you know, you tweak it. You just say, "Hey, listen, can right. you do that line going from the bookcase to the desk over here?" And you know, and, uh, and Robert, can you just like delay your entrance a beat right. before you know? They, you tweak it. Right. And right. then when you bring in the keys, you know, you just you shoot it, you knock it out. That's how we work together. Yeah. yeah um, also, in, in addition to this, I think you, the big part of the thing is meeting your other actors and your co-players and truly learning to listen to each other. I mean, listening is half the game, you know, in this whole acting thing, and, uh, and then responding moment to moment. In the last three uh, months, I've had the pleasure of working from a big budget, Final Destination 5, where we shot in 3D, and we worked two days to shoot three pages. And then right after that, I'm on an independent Unbroken where we're putting down eight pages a day. Now, which one do I prefer? <laughs> the financial freedom from the, from the two, two days and three pages is terrific and allows and energizes me to go into the eight pages a day, which is actually more challenging 
You know what I mean? It's challenging in a way that I got eight scene, uh, eight pages with maybe three scenes that are all over the script, different places, but I have to do my homework, like Michael said, in the living room to know what the beat is, the beats are, the objectives, the arc, all of that, and then it becomes challenging. And then hopefully, with the, with the fourth wall participating, it, it makes sense. So what you're saying is, is you like to be challenged. You love it. You love it. Like, like you love it when the director gives you a little adjustment. You yes. love to be able to make That's those little mystery. tweaks and adjustments. This is what this is the essence of being a pro. Yes. You know, hey, you make those little adaptations and those little adjustments. So wow, you know, and you fly with it. And, and it's also wonderful. Revelation. It's wonderful when when you come up with something and the director loves it. Right. It makes it, you expand it. Right. right. That's fun too. That, that, then you feel like you're on the same page and it's rewarding. I think for one of my films, I'm not going to give you the title, but honestly, the best lines, and I wrote the thing, the best lines in that movie were all ad lib by the actors. Every single one of them. I look back, go back and I watch that film, and I swear, I'm like, I'm like I, I just don't know what the hell I'm doing with these actors, what the hell they're doing. You know, it just happens, I guess. That's the essence of what we do. I mean, this is the ultimate, you know, physical art form. It's just astonishing, you know, how we get on set and get on place and it's sort of goes and, you know, the thing begins to make itself. You know, and that's, that, that's, that's, that's just an extraordinary phenomenon, unlike anything else that we ever experience. All right, so back on the, uh, let's go back here. I like that. Well said. Um, back on the, this is our best of our school. Wrap it out before we wrap it out. Um, Mikey, what are you, what are you seeing out there today that you, that, you know, that is buzzing out there? Uh, there's a lot of uh, good independent stuff that's been uh, coming around. Um, did anyone get to see a movie called A Mare that played down at the Cinema Village recently? No. It's, it's one of those kind of great films that never really got the attention it should have. It's this incredible homage to Jalo films. It's a complete stylistic exercise that. Uh, if, you, if it's still there, I'm not sure if it is, but if you get a chance to see it, definitely check that one out. And um, I'm just really a big fan of the stuff that Larry Fessenden has been doing, the stuff that he's been producing. Um, he had one called Bitter Feast that just played at the Gastro Pub Theater in Brooklyn, and he has another one called Stakeland, which is a vampire film from the guys who did Mulberry Street, if anyone remembers that yeah. one. Yeah. <coughs> this is, it's like a huge step up beyond. It's Zombie rats. Yeah. <laughs> this one is a, it's sort of like a, a vampire road movie. It's kind of like if Terrence Malick did a horror film, it might look like this. Um, but it is, it's really, a, I mean, they shot it for under a million. It looks like about 10 million. They shot it all over these beautiful locations. And um, it's a real human story in the midst of all the vampire stuff. So, um, so that one I really liked. Um, I really enjoyed a movie called Monsters that uh, might still be playing around. Um, if, if anyone saw Skyline, and I hope you didn't subject yourself to that, this is the good version. Tell us how you really feel. Uh, I could go on for hours. It's, it's probably the worst thing I've seen all year. But anyway, um, Monsters is made similarly. It's uh, a guy who did visual effects, went out and shot this movie for no money, took it home and put the visual effects in. Uh, it's not really a horror film, but it, as a genre film and as an exercise in what a filmmaker can do just going out and, and doing it himself, basically. It's kind of a, an object lesson, too, but it's also a really well done film. So there's there's actually a lot of good independent stuff that's been coming out lately. It's kind of exciting to see all these things. And um, also Black Swan, the Darren Aronofsky film, which may not look like horror and is not really horror for about the first half. And then in the second half, it gets into this real strange Roman Polanski kind of territory. And it's probably one of the best horror films I've seen all year. So definitely check that one out, too. Anything you see that is kind of picture in the shower? Um, I was, yeah, I saw, well, it was a thriller, The Abduction of Molly, I forget the name, so it's a British film. Oh, Disappearance of Alice Oh, that's another great film. Yeah. I love that one. That was, uh, it's fantastic, and, uh, and also, well, it's not John Lee, but. Uh, what did you see? Here? Well, I, I saw a documentary on um, Cardiff, the, the British cinematographer, and he was talking about painting. The process, and I think that, uh, but he also worked at Hitchcock, so I guess it relates. And I guess knowing, you know, knowing how to, to capture what you want, so you can control the essence. So, uh, so I'm glad that you really. I'm looking forward to the sequel, which, believe it or not, is called Piranha 3 Double D. No. no. Wow. Coming next August to the 
interview you, but I'm not making that up. Wow. Uh, you know, the great Christopher Lloyd here, and you've got the, you've got the great Christopher Lloyd on set. And you've got Richard Dreyfuss in the first scene, and you put in my two flushing down the toilet. They credited him, they credited him as Hooper, Matt Hooper, in the end credits. So literally, I just, I, I hated that movie so many fucking ways. I, I, I just, I want to shit myself. I hate it. I hate it so much. I went to see it because I saw the original on the drive and it was one of the most nostalgic times of my life. I was just with my, my, my ex wife and we went and just saw the original together. And then we were in front of all our dogs with the truck. You know, no problem. And then the very next day, and I was going to make a sequel. I didn't know the title. <laughs> There's been a lot of, of 3D announcements, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's become the latest bandwagon, because I'm sure we've all seen some of the movies that came out recently that post-converted into 3D and just looked well, that's terrible. Good. Yeah. That's great. I was thinking more of Clash of the Titans, if anyone saw that. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's going to be very interesting to see where, like, by, by this time next year, whether 3D is another fad that kind of goes away or whether enough people are really shooting for 3D and, and thinking about it when they're making the film. Well, I, I was like, when I was at the press screening for um, my soul to take, and, like that they threw it, I remember taking the glasses off, I'm like, this just doesn't <laughs> seem 3D. What? And you take the glasses off and it's perfect. It's a perfect crystal clear image I'm looking at. It. And I, Only not no, I was like, this thing, I'd ask like this. <laughs> Seriously, and then all of a sudden it would go blurry for a half a second. Because that's where, that's where the computer, because it wasn't shot. Right. Wes Craven did not shoot that film in 3D. Right. Now when you guys just finished up the, the new Final Destination, I actually was impressed with the 3D in the last one. Yeah, but it's... You know, film sucked though. But the 3D is good. Well, that's I, I, do, I do think this one is returned to the first one. And I didn't know those cameras were like five hundred thousand dollar units on scale, and they have three of them on camera. And, you know, the crew is just coming home. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never done it in my life. Excuse the reference for the machine as a most person. The excuse they used on Piranha, the reason they shot in two D and converted is we can't get those expensive cameras near the water. Mm. And you think, well, then why did you decide to do a piranha job right. in 3D in the first place? <laughs> you do rattlesnake in 3D and shoot it in the next place. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in uh, uh, 3DD, what was it? 3DD. 3DD. <laughs> Where are they going to put the camera? Uh, probably on the cleavage. No, I don't even say that. No, and did you see any things that you uh, I don't know. Uh, it's not really a pure horror film, but it, I think it's pretty horrific. It's killer inside me. Uh, yeah, I thought that movie was really good, and it dealt with, I mean, it, had, it had hard elements and hallucinatory, you know, the, the hallucinations and things, it's, it's a, I think it's a great movie, and it's so overlooked. Yeah, Casey Affleck has some uh, and, and, serious and so, pain and, going. And you know what, it got mediocre reviews, were shocked. It got terrible reviews on the West Coast, and I, you know, Nancy and I saw Casey do the play about the drug dealers in college. Um, I've seen him on stage. And uh, he's really someone to be reckoned with, I think. And I, I thought he was really interesting in the Jesse James film, too. And uh, Gone Baby Gone. Oh, Gone Baby Gone, yeah. Oh, baby gone, yeah. yeah. He, he, you know, that's a terrific. He, he, it, you know, I know we've all seen it, but I think that you, you still have to give kudos to let the right one in, the Swedish guy. Yeah, because it took, it, the real difficulty was that it took this tired, horrid, Old war horse of 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 the of a vampire mythos and completely reinvented and reinvigorated at least for my money and really played with some nasty stuff. I, I, after I saw the Swedish film, Nancy found the uh, source material, the book, and I highly recommend the book. I felt like a fourteen year old boy with a Stephen King novel in the blankets when I read it, and it was really creepy and scary and violent and strange and aberrant and. Um, you know, and I gotta say this because I know we, we, we all like to kind of err in the direction of, of cult and, and everybody. I thought there was a, a, a reasonably good um, mainstream effort last year that I kind of like called the crazies. Um, I, and, and, I, I just, and I think part of it because the acting was so terrific in that. The guy that played the deputy, I don't know his name, maybe somebody here knows who I'm talking about. No, no, the deputy, he's the deputy. He was the sheriff. That guy is great. And it's, it's like, 
you watch that movie for the second time, you, this kid is a remarkable, remarkable young talent, you know. Did you see the remake of Left or Right Funny? I haven't seen it. I, okay. <laughs> I really liked it. I, I, it. I, I absolutely hated it. Really? And I, it's a beautifully made film, but it took out all the, well, everything that made the Swedish film so original was totally removed from, from the American remake. And that's what really killed me when I saw that film. It was like usually the way though. What? Is it what if they pick a decent uh, European film or Asian film and it's more than decent and Hollywood it really sucks. I, I disagree. I I am the biggest fan of the Swedish one and I thought aside from a couple of obvious scene omissions, I think we all know one of them in yeah. particular, yeah. there's there's actually kind of a very adult theme uh, tone to let me in, which very easily could have been, you know, the director fought you know, it's about kids, so they, the studio wanted to either age them or tone it down to a PG. And I think, as as an American studio horror film, I think it's actually it's got some pretty heavy stuff in it. Stuff that you wouldn't probably see if it was something generated for the studios. If, if the Swedish one hadn't come first, but, I know. But what surprises me though is about the second one is when you go to the source material to look, there is such a neat, amazing essay with the Renfield character in that book. And it comes to such a phenomenal climax. And there's a, a rape and an actual regeneration of a victim like a lizard's tail regrowing on a lizard that's had its tail cut off by little boys that are tormenting it, you know, in the woods. And I never read anything like that. And I think, why would you want to remake it and not include that stuff? That's why. So the sins of omission for the second one are my problem with it. Not that it wasn't a, a, a valid exercise, you know, big studio, you know, a Hollywood exercise, but that, go, I didn't think they would have gone back to that source material and included that stuff, because it's just this just remarkable thrust to it, and, and, and revisionist vampire mythology. Uh, one thing about that, that film, obviously, all of us New Yorkers here, uh, uh, we were just like so goddamn happy to hear that horror film for one of the Tribeca Film Festival in San Diego. Oh, absolutely, yeah. We were like, yeah, to the hero. Balls, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> showcase is fun stuff. There, there's it actually is, another it. one they showed. It's I think it's coming out next year. It's called uh, Dream Home, which is not to be confused with Dream House. It's a big Hong studio Kong film. It's this great Hong Kong film, and it's very topical. It's about a woman has this dream apartment she wants. She can't afford it, so she starts killing everybody else in this apartment building <laughs> so she can get her dream apartment. And it's incredibly gory, it's very funny, it's very kind of socially aware, and I think someone's picked it up for US release for next year, so it's called Dream Home, so look for that one next year too. And of course, um, what I'm gonna throw is every goddamn movie that's playing here at the New York City Horror Film Festival. That's what you guys want to go see. And I think we're time to wrap up the panel. And I thank Michael Wright.